Well, welcome along to another Know My Faith Monday podcast. My guest uh, this time is Chris Savage, who's the director of Ariel Australia. Is it director, Chris? Is that the right word? Oh, that's the term I've used, yeah. <laughs> <Is> it, <laughs> what's, the, what's the official term? Oh, yeah, yeah director of Ariel Ministries Australia. That, that sounds good. That's what I use. <laughs> yeah, it's a, that's a long way from uh, an aircraft engineer to directing Ariel Australia. Oh, right, that's <laughs> Worlds apart, mate. Well, hang on, back, we'll back up. You don't look Jamaican. Do I need a cricket bat? Yeah, that might help. <laughs> well, Dreadlocks, uh, maybe. Mate, uh, it's like people say, oh, you're Australian, but you don't look Australian. Well, what's an Australian look like nowadays? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're just... Uh, I'm just one of the amalgam of lots of people, mate. I'm, I'm I am from Jamaica, Jamaica, born in Jamaica. Yeah. Um, migrated to Australia back in 1971. Okay, so uh, Jamaica was the, your your formative years in yeah. the 60s. Yeah. What was it like back then? Uh, it, it was a great life, but then it began to change. You uh, know, in, in the in the late 60s, we had a turmoil in the US and the Black Panther movement started to spread into the West Indies. And then, you know, things became um, far more dangerous for us. So we shifted out of there, either to New Zealand or Australia. There, there were our choices, okay. but uh, we chose Australia because it was a little bit bigger than New Zealand. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, New Zealand's still a little bit bigger than Jamaica, I've oh, just got to say. It's a, it's a lot yeah. bigger. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we were 44 miles wide and, yeah. and 140 miles long. So, you know, that's pretty big for the West Indies. <laughs> <laughs> How was that for a, uh, what were you then, 11, 12 years old? I migrated when I was uh, 14 or 15. 14 or 15, yeah. Yeah. 40. So what was that like? Because that's that's like leaving all your friends behind, oh, your culture, everything. Left everything, mate. Left everything behind. Family, um, friends, everything. Schooling came to a, a foreign country. Uh, you know, which to us uh, was was Australia was foreign. Uh, first of all, we uh, there were so many white folk here. <laughs> we we're not accustomed <laughs> to see so many white people. Yeah. Um, you know, and and so. We came here virtually with, with no family um, and we shifted up to a place called Cairns in northern Queensland simply because we had some other Jamaicans had already moved there. So we had a couple of Jamaican families up there. Okay. Uh, and that was it, mate. Sat back at school and it was all very strange. Yeah, the, the only thing constant would be the temperature would be about the same. Temperature, temperature was about the same. That's why we shifted yeah. to Cairns because the, the yeah. climate was similar. <laughs> Were you brought up in a uh, in a Christian family? Uh, we went to church at uh, Christmas and Easter. Good answer. <laughs> That's the family. <laughs> but my elderly grandmother made sure I, 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 my sister and I would be picked up every Sunday morning and taken to Sunday school and church. Um, you know, in in my young years, uh, to a Grace Missionary Church, which was which was formed by missionaries, uh, and that was. Um, my introduction to church life knew absolutely knew nothing about it. It, it was just all foreign to me. Um, yep. All I can remember is my clothes used to itch sitting there for hours in a, in a church, which I knew nothing about what was going on. But yeah, you know, I, I, at that time, I was probably about 12, 11, 12, 13. And then uh, as I got older, I went fishing <laughs> with the parents on the weekend. <laughs> Fair enough. I, we go through. Um, we go through probably. I mean, for, for where we're talking with with the understanding of, uh, as we say, with know my faith, the historical and cultural context of the scriptures of our faith. Uh, we go through two stages, I think, of revelation, Chris. We we have this initial stage where we we understand that Jesus is God and that He came down and He died for us and rose again, and then we sort of take our faith a little bit more seriously. Yeah, because I mean, you, you answered, you said, you know, we went to church, yeah. you know, Christmas and Easter. So the, the basic understanding of Christianity was there, but no depth of yeah. knowledge. Yeah. And, then, and then we go through the second transformation when we actually recognize the, the, the Jewishness of the scriptures and the Jewishness of Jesus. Yeah. And, and, and again, it, it just takes this extra dimension in our faith. 
Yeah, well, well, let me just share with you just quickly, um, you know, my, my coming to faith. Um, you know, my coming to faith was very late in, well, sorry, I, I had a, I had a, I had a, uh, in the West Indies, I had a, uh, we had a, we had servants and one of, one of our servants, she was a, what I'd call a holy roller. Yeah, she was Pentecostal and, and uh, she said to me one day, I think it's about nine or 10, she said, you need to, you need to accept Jesus. You need to say this prayer. And I remember I wanted to get past her to get to the toilet. She wouldn't let me get past until I said the prayer. So I said the prayer, but I had no idea what it was. Now, whether that had an influence, I don't know. But uh, it wasn't until I came to Australia and, and uh, I came to Australia in 71. And in 1984, 1984, uh, a girlfriend of mine who had shifted to Perth just came to faith. She was a Catholic. She just came to faith. Uh, and she sent me a good news Bible. And she said, look, you know, ha have a read of it. Uh, you know, she said, what do you think of the Bible? I said, oh, it's a great book. I never read it, but she said, yeah. ha have a read of John's gospel. Mate, I read the first three chapters of John's gospel, and I realized that what I was reading was true. I didn't know what to do. All I said was, Jesus, I said, I know what I'm reading is true. Um, here I am. You know, what now? You're in your in your mid twenties at this stage. Yeah, I would have been uh, eighty four. What's that? I, I would have been. Uh, so carry yeah, the three, yeah, twenty eight, yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah twenty eight. Yeah, yeah. Trying to think. Which is kind of kind of late for making a. Um, well, I suppose. Uh, hang on. We go back. You, you had the background in the church. You had this other thing. So it was to me. It sounds like it was there anyway. Well, no, I I, I wouldn't think it was there. I, I just I just had no idea. I thought I was a yeah. good person. I believed in a God. I believed in God. Therefore, I just figured I'll be okay. I'll get where everybody goes to heaven. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so I knew about heaven. Um, but when I read that and I came to faith, I, I you know, I then went to a little Anglican church um, where my, who is now my father-in-law, um, you know, and he did a bit of foundational work with me. But it wasn't until many, many years later, in fact, from nineteen. Uh, from about 1984, when I came to faith, uh, up until uh, about 2009. 2009, you know, I, I was, by then I was in the church, um, you know, an elder. I was also um, doing some study, you know, online study. I was doing some stuff with yep. Chuck Missler. And, and, you know, he sort of got me tweaked a bit. Oh, geez, there's a lot. Not in this Bible. Yeah. He messes with your brain, doesn't oh, he? He messes with your brain. But I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I said, I need somebody to help me understand the Jewish book. And uh, four clicks in my mouse, and I came upon this uh, Ariel website. There's a little Jewish guy there. Uh, there's, a, there's a shield of, uh, of David there. I said, oh, that looks yep. pretty Jewish. Clicked on that. Um, they had this come and see series, which is a which I downloaded every one of them. And I thought, this is fantastic. For the first time in my life, I am seeing a systematic teaching of you know what it's all about. Yeah. And I started to come and see, and not long after that, I, I started, I, I clicked on a, a thing called um, um, uh, Yeshua. The life of Messiah from a Jewish perspective. Clicked and yeah. downloaded the the, the uh, MP3s. My that that hooked me. That absolutely hooked me. <laughs> the come and see is sort of like um, what's the what's the word they use for that ten course meal, the digger station. You, know, <laughs> you have these, you know, it's, they come and see. Oh, this is awesome, yeah. but I need more. I want more of that one. Yep, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I I I teach to come and see to new believers but it, it it is the most wonderful foundation for every christian if they if they do that come and see series it's just yeah. brilliant we go it's all built upon each other we go from the bible right down to the end times and it, it just it just covers so much it, it is it's a great series great foundational series and you just you know you download it and study it at home yeah. Um, free downloads free That's downloads great. yeah from yeah. any of the ariel websites you know so 
that really got me going because I realized, hey, there's a lot in this Bible. And then I went, I went to uh, after I downloaded that Cummins, that, that uh, Yeshua, I thought yeah. I got to, I got to go to America and, and meet these people to see whether they're normal people, you know, or whether they're, you know, floating off the ground or, or just weird. Okay, let's let's uh, let's unpack that because this is one of the problems that we have is whenever you, I'm assuming, Chris, you don't have any Jewish blood. Not that I know of, no, 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 d neither do yeah, I. But yeah. but what has happened over the last 20, 30 years is anybody that's not anybody, but this is generalization, yeah. obviously. But people that start to look into the Jewishness of our faith, that look into this, that, and the other thing, yeah. um, they you do tend to go, are they normal people or are they really weird? You know, they're getting out the the kippers and the and all of this and think overbalancing yeah. and going way too far. Yeah. I'm a Gentile. I live as a Gentile, but I live as a believing Gentile. Yeah. I I I can't be a Jew. <laughs> I can't be a Jew, mate. God created me a Gentile, and so I live as a Gentile. And uh, yeah. you know, so, but yeah, you're right. There are there are many who want to become Jews um, for whatever reason. Uh, maybe they feel closer to God. I don't know. But we're created what we are. Therefore, we yeah. live in what we are, and we do our best in what we are. First of all, to bring the gospel to the Jewish people, because that is a command of, of, of Paul in, in, a, in, in the book of Romans. And so that is a primary part of our life is to, A, uh, bless the Jewish people materially, because we've been blessed spiritually by them, yep. but also to make certain that we are, every one of us is involved in some way in, in Jewish evangelism. Now, you know, it might be, you know, I'm on the streets up in the Melbourne Eruv, and, and I'm talking with Jews here in Geelong. Mm -hmm. I opened my house through uh, Yesh um, uh, uh, to host, you know, Israeli backpackers. Uh, we're in the COVID period at the moment, so there are not many here in Australia. Not too many, not no. Not too many. But, you know, uh, if you're not doing that, well, at least every, every, every church member should at least support uh, a ministry that is ministering to the Jewish people with the gospel. Yeah. Because, mate, we need to get the gospel to them. It, it, see, that, I mean, that's one of the things that, and if I use an Australian for this, and I, I can't remember his name, which is probably just as well. I used to pastor an Assemblies of God church, and we had a, a speaker over for one of our national conferences. And he was actually quite brilliant. What he did, uh, the, the church had uh, three sections, and there was an upper and a lower tier in those sections and he split the the the, the congregation or the, the the pastors into different groups and he said well you lot are jerusalem this is corinth and over here's uh the the you know the the great unwashed over there and he he went around and he picked up one young fellow he says okay you're timothy and he did the whole life of paul from memory wow. which, which i found marvelous yeah. but the thing is he used it he, he used it all as a pretext for tithing to the church all this stuff that paul talks about about us gentiles the responsibility that we have to give to the jews yep. he used this as his pretext for tithing completely yep. missed paul and i think that's one of the things that that people like you and i rail against mm. is here's if if we understood that that uh historic Jewish context of what Paul is saying to the Gentiles, there's no way we would be able to do that. Mm. We would say, no, Paul is giving an injunction to us, yeah. our responsibility to them. But, but, you know, but even Paul, in, in, if you follow Paul in the book of Acts, every city that Paul went to, he sought the Jews at first, even though he's yes. the apostle of the Gentiles, he sought the Jew at first to bring the gospel to them first. And then when they had enough of him, he would then go and, and you know, uh, yep. minister to the Gentiles. So that was, that was his, uh, his practice and that should be our practice, you know, but uh, you know, Rob, I, I've even had some people within the church. They're shocked when I say to them that Jesus was a Jew. 
They said, what? We didn't know Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable, isn't it? Well, no, it's biblical ignorance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's biblical ignorance. You know, and, and I, I must say, I had a wonderful pastor for, for, for many years, but um, even sitting under him, uh, I, I really didn't didn't grasp much about Israel or the Jews. I, you know, I, I just forget, well, they're there, and yeah. obviously they're there. I didn't know, you know much about it until the, the Lord later in my life, the Lord just clicked something in my brain. He says, you need to find out about the Jewish background. You need to give you know, the background to these scriptures. And that's when I found uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum and, and guys like Marshall Balliston and, and, and yeah. Gabazon. You know. And those guys, you know, uh, uh, Fruchtenbaum, he just, mate, he just, he just, he just opened, opened the Bible up to me, and I started to, to understand the Bible. And this was this was like, you know, I came to faith in '84, and this was 2010. Yeah. That's what's that? 26 years. Yeah, yeah, roughly. 26 years. 26 years that you know, you know, you could go back and say, well, I wasted 26 years because I really didn't understand the Bible. Or, Call it a quarter of a century. That makes that, it sound longer. Oh, man, it's, that's a long time. You know, long time. So this is, again, see, this is this is what I said before. This is from your basic understanding when you were growing up. The the whole Easter Christmas thing, you knew about Jesus. Yeah, sure. You, had, you, hadn't, you hadn't come to faith, but you knew about it. Yeah. And then in 84, you come to faith. Yeah. But there's this whole another... I mean, that was a quarter of a century to start yeah. with, but there's another quarter of a century until the, the actually lights come on. Or um, what I use when I'm speaking around the country in New Zealand, uh, Peter Jackson's just put a movie together, uh, which I think was called Lest We Forget. Uh, the British archives asked him to take some of the World War One footage, right? And uh, which is all black and white and you know the jerky movement because it was yeah. on the hand camera. Yeah. And so he put it through the, the computers at Weta Studios, slowed it down, smoothed it out, put it in color, uh, actually got forensic lip readers to figure out what the people were saying. And so now instead of having this black and white grainy stuff that you go, oh yeah, that's old World War One, it's now in living color with sound. And, and to me, that's what happens when you read Fruchtenbaum and others yeah. is, and you understand the Jewishness of our faith, you go, ah, now that makes sense. Yeah. I, I liken it to, you know, I tell people, it's like, you know, you see a, you see a, a multi-story building, you know, a high, a high rise building. And uh, one by one, each, each, each story, the lights are being switched on. And that's what it's like. Yeah. Lights are just being switched on as as we as as more things are just uh, illuminated to us from the scriptures, and we understand that the lights are just being switched on, you know. And it's just, mate, it's one of the most exciting things to yeah. to grasp these biblical truths. It is. Well, the, those lights must have come on pretty darn quickly for you, because if did. we're talking 2009, you're discovering this. Yep. By 2015, you're the director of Ariel Australia. Mate, uh, 2009, I went my first... Uh, 2009, I, I started discovering this. 2010, I went to... Um, uh, 2009 or 2010, I went to the, the Ariel uh, Ministries study camp in the US, went for the entire... That's the, the Camp Shoshana? Camp Shoshana. When, yeah. which is, you know, um, it's a study camp. It's not a hot dog and marshmallows <laughs> camp. It's, you know, it's, yeah, yep. you know, I was there for the entire six weeks and the first two weeks I said, hey, how can we only doing, you know, four sessions a day? We've got all this spare time. Mate, by the third week, I, I was, I was, I was glad we only did five sessions a week, the third week, <laughs> because it was just so much, you know, and, and he just, the, the the instructors there were just opening up the scriptures, mate. And uh, at that time, a lot of it just went over my head. You know, I remember the first yep. year, the, the one we were doing was Jeremiah. And it was just because, because at that time, most of our stuff in the church was preached out of the New Testament. Yes. Right? Yeah. So I didn't know much about the Old Testament, but... But now most of the most of the stuff that I teach is out of the Old Testament because 
It was just brilliant. Well, that's what Jesus Jesus said to the uh, to the Sadducees. You know, when they came in and talked to him with that, posed that question about the the woman who had had seven husbands and yeah. they all died, and and he says he says, you know, you you don't know your scriptures. Number one, that's why you made the error. But number two, you look through the scriptures because you think you'll find the truth and life in there, and they speak of me. Um, it, Jesus is all the way through the Old Testament, Absolutely. all the way through the Tanakh. Absolutely, but but even then, Rob, I mean, the early apostles they didn't they didn't preach New Testament. No, they wrote the New Testament. Yeah, they, they preached the Old Testament. You know, yeah, they yeah. were they were their evangelistic work was done with the Old Testament. Yeah, and their teaching was done with the Old Testament. Uh, and not just to Jews, their teaching to Gentiles yeah. Yeah. was done with the yeah. Jewish Old yeah. Testament. You know, uh, the, Jesus with, with, the, with the disciples on the Emmaus Road, what did he say? It says he opened up the the law from Moses the to the prophets, yeah. the prophets, which is the entire Old Testament. Yeah. And he explained to them from that so they could understand who he was and why the things happened. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, we just, the church... That we, we, we've lost it lost. through 2,000 years. I have a friend I met in uh, in northern Galilee, uh, Israel Harel. Um, and when when Sharon and I went to Israel a few years ago, which was, was for me, it was for a uh, uh, you know, for my seven-year break from the church, yeah. Um, bit of study, and I said, I said, I want to study the Jewish ordinances, particularly the table of showbread and the sacrifices, because you know, as Gentiles, we don't understand that. And uh, Israel says to me, he goes, "Well, surely you understand eating as part of worship." And I said, <laughs> "I said, I have no idea what you're talking about." He goes, "Well, maybe that's you, Rob." I said, "I said, no, I've been." Yeah, I've been a Christian since whenever I've been in, uh, you know, I'm a pastor. I know the Bible reasonably well. He says, well, maybe it's just New Zealand. I said, no, I think it's the Western. I have no idea what you mean by eating yeah. as part of worship. But for a Jew who understands the Jewishness of the Jewish scriptures, apparently that's just normal. I still don't understand it, by the way. But <laughs> Well, you know, this, this is the thing, you know, from, from about the fourth century onwards, uh, the majority of the church, well, sorry, the, the, the early church after about the first hundred plus years yeah. was becoming more and more Gentile. And by the fourth century onwards, the, the Jewishness of our faith was just lost. I think it was earlier than that. There's that uh, famous letter to Eusebius when you, the, there's a book called The Writings of the Early Church Fathers, and yeah. the, the letter to Eusebius where the writer says, he says, well, we're not like the Greeks that have their idols and this, and we're not like the Jews with their silly superstitions and yeah. bodily mutilations. And I'm going, this thing that was written in 136 AD, this is like 100 years after Jesus was crucified, less than 40 yeah. years after John died. Yeah. The Gentile church is already purposely removing itself from anything to do with Judaism. Yeah. And... <clears throat> And, and, and today, uh, you know, the Gentile church today are purposely, have purposely removed themselves from any need to take the gospel to the Jew. Well, we don't need yeah. to. As far as they're concerned, God's finished with them for a, for a, a large yeah. part of yeah. the yeah. church today. And, and also because, you know, it's, it's very seldom spoken about uh, within the church system. You know, so there is a there is an unfamiliarity with there's a there's a lack if um and i can't remember who said it it might have been chuck missler that said it but if if you let, go back 100 years or 120 years to the early 20th century uh young christian boy decides he wants to become a pastor so he goes off to bible college he's taught the scriptures from somebody who believes that the church has replaced israel so this young man's a bit of an academic. He goes and pastors a church for five or 10 years. And then somebody says, actually, you're pretty bright. Why don't you teach at the Bible college? <laughs> right? So, so now, 1930, he's in the Bible college teaching right. other pastors that the church replaced. So you get to where we are in the 21st century. Yep. These pastors and these Christians sitting in the pew haven't been told anything. anything. They don't know that they don't they don't know that if you put the salt on the steak before you put the steak on the barbecue it's going to taste so much nicer they just think that if i barbecue it better 
that's going to taste nicer when what they're missing is the, is the salt. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And and this is a thing. This is and this is what you know. Getting back to let's just say, for instance, this this uh, uh, this this book that uh, Dr. Fuchtenbaum produced, which was the Yeshua, uh, the mess, the mess, uh, life of Messiah from a Jewish perspective. That you know, going back into the Gospels, and you you once you go through that and you read the Gospels, the Gospels take on an entirely different light, because. You know, for the majority of us today, we read the Gospels and we read over things. We don't even realize that there are things there which are important yep. because the Gospel writers didn't have to write and explain themselves to the people they're writing to because, well, because they knew it. They knew it, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so, but today we we have lost that, and we we're, we're blessed in this century with you know fantastic Bible scholars yeah who and especially the you know messianic jewish scholars who actually explain to us the jewish nuances and the jewish background to the gospels and when you read the gospels you say oh, i got that oh yeah i know what he's talking about now yeah oh, i can see why they're all upset yeah you know well, you know for instance you know why were why were the pharisees all head up when you know jesus healed a leper you know, oh well, you know, obviously lepers were healed before. Well, well no, they weren't. No, no. The, they the, weren't. You know, the amazing thing is that that the bulk of the the largest section of the Torah of the law is what to do if a leper is healed. Correct. Like by far, there's pages Page. and pages <laughs> of it, and. Never was a leper healed in Israel. The only one was Naaman that we know of, and he was a Syrian. Yeah. So when Jesus healed a leper in Israel. Yep. But but even you know even that uh, Miriam was Miriam Moses' sister was healed of leprosy. However, she was healed of leprosy before the law was given. Yes. Right. There there has never been a, a Jewish leper healed after the law was given. So they had all this knowledge about, okay, what are we going to do when the leper is healed? Yeah, yeah, but they've yeah. never practiced it because as far as they were concerned, uh, leprosy is a divine judgment on an individual. Therefore, it is only God who can uh, heal that leprosy. Yeah. And so, and, and one of the things that they expected was that when Messiah comes, he will be able to heal a leper. It's interesting that they did that because the, the Jewish understanding of Messiah then and, and still is now is that Messiah would be human. You know, so it, even them, the, the, the rabbis are saying the leprosy is God's judgment, therefore God's the only one that will be able to yep. take it away. But Messiah can take it away. But Messiah is not God, but only God can take it. You know, they're, they're confusing Messiah, when themselves. When he comes, he can do these things. Yeah, right? they had a, they had a not, but but you know, but they, they had a list, and it, it, it's ironic that Jesus actually went through the list, one by one. Yep, yeah, that's right. Uh, Je Jesus constantly challenged their belief system, because uh, you know, going back to what you said earlier on, you know, Jesus says to the Pharisees, he said, he said, listen, if you guys believed what Moses wrote about me, you would have recognized me. Well, yeah. you'd think, well, what? Well, why would Jesus be saying that to the Pharisees? I mean, these guys were experts in the Mosaic law and stuff. Well, the reason he was saying that to them was because by the time he had come along, these guys had developed a, a, a body of, of uh, doctrines, which which was which became the basis of what we call the Mishnah. And in in the um, in the New Testament, you you know, we'll we'll read all oh, the tradition of the elders. Or the yeah. tradition you've, you've heard it said the, the 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 spoken tradition. Yeah. yeah, you know, and so they, for instance, you know, <laughs> there's two laws in, in in Mosaic law regarding the Sabbath, right? By the time Jesus comes along, uh, these guys had made up another 1,500 laws regarding the Sabbath. What did they do? You know, we had 613 uh, Mosaic laws. And so they didn't want to go back into, into captivity or exile again. So they thought, oh, we can't break these laws. Yeah. We need to put this, this fence around these laws to, to stop anyone from actually breaking the law. So what they did was they made tens of thousands yeah. of other laws around the Mosaic law 
to stop you from breaking Mosaic law. And Jesus. So the intention was good. The was, intention was to, to make sure that we don't offend God by breaking correct. his law. But the problem was that the offense became their became new law. The law. Yeah. Yeah. Became their new law. And that's why Jesus says, if you believe what Moses wrote, that by Jesus' day, they were filtering everything that the scriptures were saying through their man-made laws and they yeah. missed the major the major things you know and, yeah. and this is like us today you know when we look into the jewish script when we read the scriptures with the intention of understanding it with its jewish influence and its jewish background we we just pick up so much more well, that's, uh, I mean, that's the, the subtitle of Fruchtenbaum's book. Actually, I've got, I don't know if you can see behind me, there's the, the full four volumes yes. and study guides and everything on there. Um, I narrated the abridged version. Thank goodness I didn't have to narrate the, the full version. But it's, it's Yeshua, the life of Messiah, from a Messianic Jewish perspective. And it's a, it's a, a Jew who believes Jesus is God, Jesus is the Messiah, taking a look and so when um i mean i think one of the most confusing things for us is uh the switch between uh, jesus speaking plainly and then speaking in parables ah. and so what what i caught from that when i narrated the book was uh, i'm going you know in my mind i'm going yeah that's right hang on sometimes he's talking plainly and sometimes he's talking in parables and what fructoman points out he goes here's the demarcation line yes which you missed Yes. Because you're not thinking first century historical Jewish Correct. perspective. Correct. You missed it, but here's the demarcation line. He was speaking plainly here. Yep. After this event, everything's in parables. Okay. Yes. Oh. Now I understand. Yeah. And, you know, with that same thing, I mean, you know, up until that single event, he would do miracles for anyone. Yeah, there was no faith required. I mean, you know, the the the, the guy at Bethsaida, he didn't he didn't even know who Jesus was, and he healed yeah. him. Um, he didn't have exercise any faith. But once, but once that that incident took place in Matthew chapter twelve, where you know that the, the uh, Jesus actually, you know, he cast out a deaf dumb demon, um, which which again uh, was one of the messianic signs. One of the miracles. messianic signs. Yep. You know? You you had to the Pharisees couldn't cast that type of demon out, but but they said Messiah when he comes can do that sort of stuff um, in their in their rabbinic writings. So when all that took place, things changed because now the leadership had rejected Jesus. That the 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 Sanhedrin leadership had rejected Jesus on the basis that he was now demon possessed. That's why he can do these things. He's demon possessed. That's yeah. why he can well, let's, hang on, Chris. Let's let's back up with that because the people watching this, uh, you and I are a long oh, yeah, way yeah. ahead because sure. you've read Yeshua a few times. Yeah. I narrated it, and uh, yeah. actually, ironically, my wife's currently listening to me narrating it yeah. as she's uh, weeding blueberry plants. So <laughs> Jesus came; he presented himself as the Messiah. Correct. He said, "You've been waiting for the Messiah. Yeah. Yo, that's me. Yeah. Here's the proof, right?" Da, da 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 does the miracles that you have said only Messiah can do. I'm doing the miracles. Yep. This is the timing that Daniel talked about. This is this. Here's me. I'm the Messiah. Correct. And the Pharisees go, no, no, you're demon possessed. That's right. They, they at, um, at which point his whole ministry changed. Whole everything changed because the night the, the 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 leadership had now rejected his offer to them of the messianic kingdom with him as the messiah so having rejected him he now rescinds the offer of the kingdom and from then on uh, what changed well from then on he was no longer teaching the masses plainly he now taught in parables from then on it was a case of uh, a, a miracle or, or signs were done on the basis of personal faith and personal need. So an individual had to come to Jesus. Hang on, I know you're Messiah. So an indiv individual had to come to Jesus and say, listen, Jesus, uh, I need healing. Okay, well, you have a need. You believe in me. Boom, you're healed. From then on, 
the only sign that they were going to get was the sign of what Jesus said was Jonah, which was a sign of yep. resurrection. From then on, uh, he also, when he heals someone, it was always done privately. And he always told them, don't tell anyone who did this. Don't tell anyone. Yep. Prior to that was go and tell everybody that Yeshua claiming to be a Messiah has healed you. Let everybody know. After his rejection, he says, tell nobody about me. Um, you want a miracle? You need to have personal faith in me as the Messiah, and you have to have a need, and I'll heal you. And I think was there was there something in there of because um, it's a while since I've yeah. gone through the book um, about asking the Son of David have mercy on me. I think there was yes. it was like that was after the change. It was after the change. It was, it was those that came to him and said, and it's almost like saying, okay, I recognize that this has happened and you're not, you're now not really in a good mood with the leadership, but have mercy on me. Yes. But you know what, when they came to him after that and said, Oh, son of David, have mercy on me. He didn't answer him. It wasn't on to leave because he wasn't answering because he was no longer offering himself as Messiah and son of David yeah. is a messianic title. So messianic when title. the guy yeah. said, look, look, you know, he said, look, I, I know you can heal me. He said, okay, boom, healed. Yeah. But coming to Jesus and saying, well, look, I know you're the Messiah. As the Messiah, you can heal me. Uh, he says, no, I've, I've uh, rescinded that offer of being the Messiah. But I'll heal you because you know that I am the Messiah. Yeah. Uh, but not on the basis of being the Messiah am I going to heal you, but on the basis of your faith in me as the one who is the Messiah. Yeah, now, And the whole, the whole change around also with the um, so misunderstood for the last 2,000 years, yeah. the unforgivable sin. Yeah. That's right, the unpardonable sin. You know, do you know, <laughs> I remember years ago, people would say, oh, look, I'm sure I've committed the unpardonable sin. I said, well, what is it? I don't know, but I'm sure I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know, Christ on the cross took every sin. There was no sin for Christ that was unpardonable on the cross individually. However, the unpardonable sin was a sin that was committed by the generation, the, the, the Jewish generation of Jesus' day. Why? It was committed because uh, they rejected Jesus while he was physically present with them on the basis that he was demon-possessed, saying that all the works that he had done were done by the power of Beelzebub. And so what they did was, by doing that, they were actually blaspheming the Holy Spirit because, you know, uh, you and I can share Jesus with someone, but it is a Holy Spirit who will convince them that you mm. need to turn to Jesus. And so what yeah. they did was they blasphemed the Holy Spirit by saying, no, 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 uh, this was all done by Satan. And so they rejected that witness of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus pronounced upon th that generation. Uh, and from then on in the right, when in, in the gospels, you see the gospel writers always speak, Jesus always speaking about, this generation, this generation, this yeah. adulterous generation, which generation? The generation that rejected him on the basis of demon possession. We oh. miss that because we don't get that, that, that perspective. Right. Interesting, I've just been listening to an audio book, um, a guy called Eddie Jacku, who is a Holocaust survivor, 100 years old. He's an Australian. Yeah. It, um, he turned 100 in April last year. Um, a marvelous book, recommend it. It's called The Happiest Man in the World or The Happiest Man on Earth. But he talks about when he went back to Belgium uh, at the end of World War II and the people there, uh, and he said, you know, you did nothing. You went, you silently went along with the authorities. Mm. When the Nazis came in, you did nothing. And part of that thing with Jesus rejecting this generation was that he had presented himself with every credential he needed every as Messiah. Yep. The rabbis, the leadership had rejected him and the people had sided with the leadership. Correct. He goes, okay, you've made your choice. So this generation yeah. will now receive this, 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 That's and this. Right. And it was it was a national sin because yeah. uh, I mean we, we see Paul the Apostle coming to faith. Uh, and we see, you know, at Pentecost, thousands, uh, yeah. predominantly Jews, came to faith. So it, it was a generational sin. It wasn't an individual sin. 
it was no it was it was it was corporate it's, it's similar to uh, i don't know how you feel on the seven churches in revelation but but to me they are indicative of the age of the church sure and and we are in the laodicean church at the moment and i'm so sick and tired of these prophets and others that are going around saying the church is going to wake up oh, it, it can't the the church is prophesied as being lukewarm in laodicean but at the end of each of those letters because at the beginning it says to the angel of the church yeah. the church but at the end jesus says to he who, who overcomes the individual can break it and that's again that's the individual that got healed by the messiah after he rejected yep. the generation yep and and that sin cannot be uh, uh credited to any other generation no it, because jesus is not physically present with any other generation but we do know from the scriptures that the generation that survives the tribulation they will recognize that he is the messiah and he'll call for his return so you know that generation down then uh will actually recognize him as the messiah and call for yeah well that's another one of uh shin can you bring me the um the footsteps book that's uh, yeah the footsteps get, of the get the producer to bring it um yeah. the footsteps of the messiah so again thank you very much uh that's a, another massive tome <laughs> yeah. that's i think that's brilliant 28 28 and a half hours audio yep. reading that and yep. about 400 hours for me trying to get through it yeah. but the when you read this so the, the footsteps is a term that the rabbis used they say when you see these signs yeah. these are the footsteps of messiah coming now we know that's the messiah coming again yeah. they they think it's coming the first, first time. time but taking all the end times prophecies which which fruchtenbaum does in the book yep. and putting them in order and in going order. this must happen this must happen mm. and that nation the, the the jews who after the middle of the tribulation when the antichrist breaks the treaty and they're all you know, they're fleeing from him yep. and finally call out to yeshua yeah. you know yep. um it's it's just i don't know i mean i've been on this journey uh, as a as a gentile believer in the jewish messiah for, for you know from that perspective for probably 15 years 10 15 years um and when i read this stuff it's just it's mind boggling it, it is that's that's what i say mate the bible is the is the most exciting book you will ever read yeah it, it is the most brilliant book it's not near enough is good enough the Bible is very specific. In all his prophecies, it's very specific, you know, and, and it might, it, it, I, I just can't tell you how, understanding the, the Jewish flavor, the Jewish background, it's just opened up the Bible in, in, a, in a most wonderful way. It, yeah. You know, so much so that, you know, in 2014, I, I I had to make a choice: keep working and doing this part time, or give up work and and teach what I have been taught. And virtually, the Lord called me out of um, full out of my, my employment, and I just went from you know getting a wage to now I just work and and do this. Why? Because I know how much the explanation of the Bible to me, with its proper perspective has just uh, op opened up my life you know and, and i want to see other people i want to see there's lights being switched on and that on that high-rise building let's let's let me try and use an analogy um because your career was as an aircraft engineer yeah. so when you fly in a plane you have so much greater perspective of what's going on than i do yeah I just know the laws of aerodynamics means that the airflow over the top of the wing goes faster than the flow underneath the wing. So it's got some sort of lift yeah. capacity, but, <laughs> but, you know, so when you're flying on a plane, you're just going, man, this is amazing. And I'm just going, oh, we're flying. Well, and, and that, that's the understand to me, that's yeah. the understanding with yeah. that, that Jewish side of things. I'm not, I'm not sitting there going, oh, I wish I was an aircraft engineer. Yeah. You know, most people, they hop in the plane, all they consider about is their destination. 
you know, yeah. I hop in a plane, I sit there and I, I hear noises and oh, well, that's the flaps going up, that's the gear going up, you know, and oh yeah, this is. A, <laughs> do, you, you know, just, do you ever get one where you sit there and you go, oh, hang on, that's not right. That, that's right. You say, oh, that, that's, <laughs> I don't, that's the, on, geez, there's a bit of a change in the engines down there, you know, oh, yeah. you know whereas average person, I hop on, all I'm worried about is my destination. And yeah. again, again, Rob, that is, that is, you know, a bit symptomatic of the church today. Hey, I'm in, I'm saved. Hey, you know, I'm just waiting. Well, to get there. that's that's the whole different topic that w- which yeah. we might do another podcast in the future <laughs> just just on that. But the belief that believing in Jesus is enough mm. is not a biblical belief for salvation. That, that's enough for it's, salvation. Belief in, in in Jesus as the one who 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 died he, he died for our sins. He was buried. He rose from the dead. That is the gospel message. However, you know the uh, that's not that's not the end of it. That's only the start. We now need to go and make disciples. Yeah, yeah. You know, we need to the, go and. Well, I mean, the the Jewish the Jewish perspective is that. Faith is always accompanied My by work. works. This is this is what I'm trying to yeah. say. And the problem is when you say this, people start going, "Oh, you're talking salvation by works." No, 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 I'm no. not talking salvation by no. works. James. What I'm saying is the the Gentile, the Greek mindset that we have in the West yep. is that I just need to believe. Yep. And what James says, and Paul actually says exactly the same thing. If you understood the Jewishness yeah. of it, is that if you believed it, it would turn into actions. It doesn't just sit in your head. And so from a even from a Christian point of view, if you believe in Jesus, it's followers of Jesus who put their belief into practice, yeah. not just those who sit there. You look at the end times, the the disasters come on the world, the 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 bowls of wrath are poured out. The men of the world are uh yelling and screaming and cursing. Mm-hmm. Jesus, mm. right? Do they believe in Jesus? Yes, 100%. Yeah. They believe they know full well he's the one. But, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, this is just it. I mean, you know, for many people, you know, you say, well, you know, you got to believe in Jesus. I say, yeah, we believe. I mean, look, pagans believe that a man called Jesus died and rose from the dead. Yeah. Uh, but, but you know, we, what does believe mean? Believe means to place our trust in him to be our our substitutionary death, place your trust in him that he took the penalty for our sin. We are doing something by placing our trust in Jesus to deliver us from what is to come. It's not simply, yeah, I know a guy called Jesus. Yeah, I know he died and he rose from the dead. Yeah, that's not what we're talking about. That's not what Paul's talking about. Yeah. You know, that's not what Jesus is talking about. You know, he's talking about placing your trust in me that I will do what I said I'm going to do. Yeah. You know? And 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 in your life, I can do what I say I'm going to do. Um, right. I was saying to somebody on the weekend, uh, you know, the thing that we want to hear when we stand in front of Jesus is, well, well done, good and faithful servant. Right. And I said, what is it you're being faithful at? Because pew warming isn't on the list. Not at all. Because you, know, you either get well done, good and faithful servant or depart from me. So... If you're being a faithful servant, that involves it must doing. produce something. Yeah, you got to do something it must to be faithful. Producing at it. fruit, you know, and yeah. uh, you know, and so you know, even Jesus, he teaches us in in the Gospels. You know, there's three types of disciples. You know, there there are those who are curious about who he is. You know, and there 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 are those who are convinced that he is the Messiah. But then the, the third type are those who are committed. To Jesus. I mean, the convinced is still a saved individual, but the ones who are committed to Jesus and to the task uh, of being the disciple and the disciple maker, they're the ones who are who are producing fruit. Yeah. You know, it's not just a case of uh, being saved and say, "Oh, yeah," you know, "Oh, wow, I'm I'm in now. I can relax." No, you're in now. Get on with the job. Yeah. What's yeah. The job. Make disciples. How are you going to do that? Preach the gospel, baptize them, te- teach them to obey everything that Christ has taught us to obey. That's it. Yeah. yeah. You know? 
And it's becoming, uh, in some ways, I mean, it is becoming harder and harder to get that across in the church. I mean, you obviously travel around Australia speaking. Um, uh, how often do you see the lights come on? Uh, well, usually when you when you will go to, to somebody and, and speak, uh, you know, and teach them this stuff for the first time, it's usually jaw-dropping because you're thinking, I I've been... You know, most a lot of people will say, "Look, I've been a Christian for thirty years, and I've never heard this before. How come I'm hearing this now?" I said, "Well, finally, the Lord's getting through to you." you know? Yeah. But you know, for for most for most that you look, I, I did a part. I did a Passover service um, when we were allowed to meet together. I think it was in 2019. About hundred and about hundred and three people turn up. Ninety percent of them had never done a Passover or knew what it was about and when you do the Passover they realize that hang on that's Jesus everything the bread that is striped the bread that is pierced the bread that is unleavened that's Jesus yeah you know so it's a case of their eyes were open and they were excited because they said, "Whoa, we can see, we we understand now what the Passover is all about. Yeah. Jesus is the Passover." Yeah, right? yeah. And, and, and as you say, by by doing the Passover, not just by reading about the Passover, but right. by actually doing it. And I, and I've got a friend of mine who says uh, 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 he has Jewish blood. He's not Jewish Jewish, but he's, yeah. he has Jewish blood. But he says he's trying to do that as well. And they're they're even doing things like Sukkot. They're building. Yeah. The booths for yeah. themselves not because the torah says to do that because we're not under the torah of moses anymore yeah. we're under the, the law of messiah but he's he says by doing that it goes ah now i get it now i get it you know i do the same i'm almost i'm tempted to pick up the guitar behind me but when i teach guitar i teach this little thing you do on the fingerboard yep. and i said just they go why am i doing this just do it why am i doing this just you'll, do it you'll know what oh now i, I get it that's right that's no, it. Uh, and that's it, Rob. And that's why this, uh, you know, Yeshua, the life of Messiah, it, it is such an exciting um, thing to teach because every, every session you teach, people are walking away having learned something they never knew before and the lights are being switched on. Yep. You know, yep. and, and that's... You know, this this is a series I continually teach. I I, I finished the series uh, last um, uh, early December, and the following week I started back at the beginning again, yeah. and I just keep rotating through it year after year after year after year. Why? Because it is such an important part of our education. It's it's an important part of getting to know Jesus. Yeah, and the more we know Him, the more we see God. <sighs> the more likely we are to want to tell others tell about us. him because you know um, it's, i think one of the reasons why we don't uh share well I mean, two reasons why we don't share god so much jesus so much with others is number one we don't know him so well so we don't know what we're sharing and number two we don't know not who god is but what god is mm -hmm. Um, like Isaiah in Isaiah 6, when he saw the high, Lord high and lifted up, yep. and he goes, oh, I'm dead. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but I've seen the living God, I'm dead. Yeah. Um, and so when we see what God is, we're compelled to, to share that truth, that understanding with others. Yeah. I, I, but I think also, Rob, I mean, as we gain further understanding of Jesus, what he's like in the Gospels, our confidence level grows and yeah you know we start to well okay let's just give it a go let's just you can you can answer happen. those questions the mormons and jehovah's ask you correct, yeah. correct. The, 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 jehovah's for instance you know well you know why when he said i am why do they pick up stones to stone him not because he's a, a little g god it's because he's declaring himself to be god yeah and the pharisees understood that and that's why yeah. I wanted to stone him. But yeah. you know, to the JW, uh, oh, no, 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 no. Well, well, 
they just were offended because of something. They're offended because Jesus was making himself equal with God. It's interesting that we don't know as a church, and again, you know, we, we are the Laodicean lukewarm church. The church cannot change that. But if you're watching this or listening to this, the promise is to the individual who overcomes. Um, but as a church, we don't know our scriptures. We can't give the answers. We're not, the Jehovah's Witnesses are indoctrinated with the scriptures. The Mormons are indoctrinated with their scriptures. The Muslims are indoctrinated with their scriptures. They know them well. We are under the belief that if I simply believe from a Western mindset, I don't need to do anything. I can be the worst Christian in the world. You know, you, you, Chris Savage might get cupboard and good and faithful servant and Rob Holding might get, get inside. But I'm still in <laughs> well, and that's all that matters. Yeah. So I don't need to do anything. Yeah, yeah. you know, and 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 that's that's through lack of... Uh, understanding. Understanding, you know, yeah. lack of good sound teaching. And, uh, you, know, f- you know, for instance... Um, you know, most people would probably have never read through the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. You know, you need to be doing it at least once a year, reading through it. And uh, I do that just to keep the weeds down on the path, if you like. <clears throat> you know, just as I read, I just read through it. But then yep. you know, you, you'll do your, your individual book studies. But you, you're just <clears throat> reading through it just to keep the weeds down on the path. You know, just to f- keep yourself familiar with the word of God. But this is not happening today you know it's just not happening that they're they're uh, relying upon the pastor to read uh, the scriptures to them on a sunday and that's their uh, um you know that's their bit of the word for the week yeah yeah and that's it's not enough it's not, it's no, it's no, subsistence no. that's i mean again if i refer back to the book that i was uh, just listening to the from the holocaust survivor um, when he came out of Auschwitz, he was weighed 28 kilograms, right? He got just enough food to stay alive. Wow. Mm. That's all. Uh, was he healthy? No, uh, he was not healthy. Was he surviving? Just. And so many Christians are surviving on reading the word for today or every day with Jesus with one verse and reading the scriptures that the pastor puts on the screen yeah. on a Sunday morning. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I use, I use lots of scriptures when I'm preaching. I'm, I, I assume that you do too, because we go all over the Bible, but um, I remember one, a friend of mine, Ian Vale, who's with Wycliffe Bible translators. He said, uh, he went to a church one time and the pastor said, he said, yeah, I was going to preach on this passage this week, but I really felt God impress on me to, to speak on this. And, you know, I searched through the Bible, Bible. I can't find a single verse about this and then spent an hour preaching on it. On what? Exactly. You know, yeah. um, the, the, the old, the old system of, of, okay, uh, let's turn here. Second Thessalonians three, nine says, da, 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 da. Bible is closed and you get 45 minutes of motivational claptrap. Well, uh, I, I must, you know, I, I I'll say this, that, uh, that, you know, being from Ariel, we are, uh, <laughs> you know, I said to uh, our editor the other day, I said, we need to realize that compared to the rest of you know what's out there we would be seen to be boring because we're just not uh, you know we're cons- we're very conservative because yeah you know because well you know this we we're, we're not we're not flashy but it was Tozer said Bible that says. pink said that it's if we're, if we're into entertainment you're either into entertainment or you're into the word of god you can't yeah. be both we, we are simply well no well you know like all, all these conspiracy theories running around you know well no we're, we're well we interpret the bible and then see where we are today in relation to what the bible says yeah uh, all this other stuff is is like uh, chasing rabbit trails it's 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 irrelevant it's irrelevant it's irrelevant you know and while you're doing that you're forgetting the mission which is to Go and make disciples. Go and yeah. preach Jesus, and again share Jesus. Um, because when I yeah, when I preached on Matthew twenty four, when I was when I was pastoring the church, I, I took about four and a half years to go through the book of Matthew. Yeah, um, and I got to Matthew twenty four, and I said, I said, look, I've I've been hedging off doing this because everybody's got their own own interpretation about what the end times are like. 
Uh, so I said, well, so we just said, we just read the whole chapter. And then I said, okay, close your Bible. If I told you that Jesus was coming back at three o'clock this afternoon, what's your job? Go and make disciples. I said, if, if I told you that Jesus isn't coming back for 200 years, what's your job? Same job mate. Go and make disciples. Yeah. The rest of it is completely irrelevant. Yeah. Go and make disciples. Yeah. And to do that, you've got to know your God. Absolutely. You, well, you have to be and continuing to get to know your God. I mean, we'll never know yeah. him because he's... He, oh, that's, that's the beauty. Yeah. In eternity, we'll still be getting to know him, um, you know. But uh, we've lost sight of the mission. And, you know, and it's the, you know, Jesus trained his disciples in the Gospels to go and continue the mission that he had started. And uh, it's the same today. He said, as, as I've sent these out, so all, all those who will be sent out by these guys, you know, Father, Father bless them. And so we, are, we have been sent out to do the same thing, continue yeah. the mission of making Jesus known. Yeah. And, and uh, we've, we've sort of lost a, a little bit of sight of that uh, or a lot of sight of that. Um, so we really need to get back to that. Uh, and again, you know, going back to the Gospels with, with the, the, the Jewish background to it, to open that up and let that speak to you. Uh, as I said before, Rob, it, it, it was the most incredible study for me. It, it, it really hooked me. Yeah. I was hooked when, because the amount of, of, uh, of illumination that was brought out of, of, of the Gospels with its Jewish influence, and it's written the it's written in the scriptures, but we just read over it and say, okay, yeah, let's uh, you know, let's yep. let's move on, you know, uh, you know, for instance, you know, um, you know, uh, J Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again, you know, and Nicodemus says, hey, well, you know, how am I going to be born again when I'm so old? Well, what what was he talking about? Yeah, we missed that completely because a lack of the understanding. Lack of understanding. Yeah. You know? Well, um, and I should say, by the way, um, if you want any of uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum's material or other material, you can get it from Ariel Australia or from us here at Know My Faith, and we'll put the uh, the, the details in the description. Yeah. But again, the key, and we've touched on it many times, is our responsibility before Jesus to pass on the Jesus that we know. I love Louis Giglio's message. Uh, a lot of his messages are great, but there was one called The Party in Heaven. And he says, the party in heaven is not you get to heaven and you go, yeah, I made it. He says, the party in heaven is you get to heaven and you see somebody you told about Jesus. <laughs> and you go, yeah, oh, I made you, it. you made it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and that's what it's about. Chris, this has been great. We are definitely going to do this again. Uh, thank you so much for your time Pleasure, this man. morning. Pleasure. Right. It's great. Uh, Chris Savage from Ariel Australia. And uh, thank you for watching and listening. And again, if you want to find out more, you can just click on the details under the podcast. God bless you.